So chapter two, this is about summarizing and graphing data. So first we're going to talk about frequency distributions. And the reasons we do frequency distributions is that we can take a large set of data and summarize it. And by doing that, we can gain some insight into the nature of the data, what it looks like. And this also gives us a basis for constructing graphs, for example, histograms, which we'll talk about in this chapter, too. So a frequency distribution would look like this. We've got categories here, numerical categories, and then the frequency for each category. In this case, if we have the ages of actresses, this frequency would mean that there were 28 actresses that were between the ages of 21 and 30. And these first numbers in each category are called the lower class limits. The second number for each category is called the upper class limit. And if we look at our upper and lower class limits, we can use that to find our class width. And this, this is an easy one to get a little bit mixed up on. It's not just the difference between the upper and the lower class limits. It's the difference between one lower class limit and the next lower class limit. So in other words, it's the distance between the actual classes. And you can see in this case that would be 10. One more thing that we're going to need to calculate is class midpoints. And for this, you're just going halfway between the upper and lower class limits for a class. So all you would do is basically take the average for this first one of 21 and 30. In other words, you'd add 21 plus 30 and divide by 2, and that would give you 25.5. You have to do this for each class, and that gives you all of your class midpoints. OK, if you're going to actually construct a frequency distribution, here's how we do it. The basic idea is to divide your whole range of data values into equal groups or classes, and then count how many data values are in each class. And this gives us the frequencies. So the first step is to find what your class width is. And most of the problems that you'll have in your homework tell you what class width to use. But a good rule of thumb if you're trying to come up with your own is that you should have between 5 and 20 classes. Or sometimes you can decide on the class width if that makes more sense. So if you're going to decide on the number of classes first, then you find your class width by taking the range, in other words, the largest data value minus the smallest data value, divide by the number of classes. This gives you kind of an approximate class width. You need to, you'll have to round it up to the next whole number so that you can cover all of the data values. So if we did that in this case, our range for our best actors over here, the largest value is 76, the smallest value is 29, so our range would be 47. If we decided to use nine classes, for example, then we take 47 and divide by 9. That would give us 5.2, and we would round up to 6. Now, in this case, since we're looking at ages, we're kind of used to talking about ages in decades. So it might make more sense in this one to decide on their class width first. And we could use 10 years just because that would be a nice, convenient class width, and it would be easy to understand. OK, once you've figured out your class width, then find a starting point. You can use the lower class limit for the first class, or you can use a number less than that if it makes more sense. Find that first, and then find the rest of your lower class limits. So for this one, our minimum value was 29, but it would probably make more sense to use 20 or 25 as a starting point. And in this one, we're going we're gonna to start with 20. So that's our lower class limit for our first class. To get our lower class limit for the next class, we just add 10, because we decided that was going to be our class width. And then we just keep adding 10 until we get all of the classes. So there, there would be our lower class limits. Then to get our upper class limits, what we want to look at is this first class starts at 20. The next class starts at 30. And we don't want them to overlap at all. So that means that this first class can only go up to 29. So basically, you can look at the, the next class, the lower class limit, and just go one less than that. So now we've got all of our classes. And notice that the lower class limits all differ by 10, and the upper class limits all differ by 10, which was our class width. Now all we have to do is go through and count how many values are in each one of these classes. 
that gives us our frequencies. So here's what our completed frequency distribution would look like. Now we can also do relative and percent frequency distributions. A relative frequency means that you're taking your frequency for one class and just dividing it by the sum of all the frequencies, or in other words, dividing it by the total number of data values that you started out with. And we can also do a percentage frequency. That's just taking these relative frequencies, which are in decimal form, and converting them to percent. The reason that we use relative frequencies sometimes is that if we're trying to compare two sets of data, if the total numbers of data values are different, it's a little bit hard to compare them with just a regular frequency distribution. So here's an example of taking a frequency distribution and converting it to relative frequencies. So here we had 28 for the frequency in this first class. If we add up all these frequencies, we get 76. So there were 76 ages listed in that original table. To get the relative frequency for this class, we take 28 and divide by our total of 76. That would give us 0.37. Then we could convert it to a percentage if we wanted to by moving our decimal point, and that would give us 37%. So these are actually relative frequencies in percentage form. So for each one of these, we just take the frequency for the class, divide by 76, and then these answers were converted to percent. And here's where we're using a relative frequency distribution to compare two different data sets. In this one, we've got drivers killed in car accidents, and notice that there are a lot more classes here, and the total frequency is a lot bigger than this one for drivers killed in motorcycle accidents. So it makes it kind of hard to compare the two distributions. If we take and convert all these to relative frequencies, and in this case they're even converted to percentages, then we can tell a little bit more about how the distributions are different. For example, if you notice in this one, the 20 to 29 age group only had 24%, but for the motorcycles that class had 41%. So we can tell that there's quite a big difference between those two. Okay, now for histograms. A histogram is really just a bar graph. A histogram has numerical values, so this is something that we use with quantitative data. And we would start with a frequency distribution, then basically each one of our classes is going to be one of the bars on the histogram. So our horizontal axis is going to be whatever our data was, in this case it was the ages. And our vertical axis is going to be the frequencies for each one of those classes. So for example, our age group from 21 to 30 had a frequency of 28, so this bar goes up to 28 on the vertical axis. We can also do a relative frequency histogram. The only difference with that is that our vertical axis has either decimals or percents. In this one, we have percentages. Now, if we have a histogram already, it's important to be able to interpret it. You'll see in the homework they talk a lot about normal distribution. A normal distribution is just something that has this kind of bell shape, so it's the tallest in the middle, it goes down on either side, and it's approximately symmetric. In other words, each side is at least approximately a mirror image of the other half. So by looking at this, we can tell um, pretty well whether we have something like a normal distribution or not, if it has all those properties. You should also be able to figure out the class width and the minimum and the maximum possible data values. So if this is all you know about a set of data, you should at least be able to figure out those things from it. So in this one, it doesn't really show you what the class width is. But if you look at this from 60 to 70, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 classes. So the whole distance from 60 to 70 is 10, and there are 5 classes in there. That means the class width would have to be 2. So we just took the 10 and divided by the 5. Now the minimum possible data value, if we go from 60, then this class would start at 58, this class would start at 56. That means our minimum possible data value is 56. And the same thing for the maximum possible value. We've got 70 here. Our next class would be at 72. So the maximum possible data value is 72. And the class with the highest frequency here is this one with the 324. And that would be from 
62 to 63. Okay, then we've got some statistical graphs. When you do the first tech assignment, you're going to see how to create these in StatCrunch. But again, you need to know kind of what StatCrunch is doing so that you can interpret these. So a stem plot just means that you're taking your data values and separating them into two parts, the stem and a leaf. And this gives you something like a frequency distribution. So for example, if you had values um, like 50, 54, 80, and so on, you could separate it so that the 10th place was your stem and the 1th place was your leaf. So right here, where we have our 5 stem, that would be the values between 50 and 59. And since there's a 0 and a 4 here, then two of our data values would have been 50 and 54. For this one, the stem was 8 and the leaf was 0, so that means the original data value is 80. Okay, and here's an example of a bar graph. And in this book, they do kind of separate histograms and bar graphs. Bar graphs are for qualitative data. So in other words, where you just have categories. And again, this is something that you see a lot. So in this one, this was, I think, reasons for changing telephone service is where this data came from. So we have our different categories, the different reasons people gave for changing their telephone service, and then the frequencies, again, are in bars. And this one actually counts as being a Pareto chart. That's just a special case of a bar graph. That's where you list your categories with the highest frequency first and then going down from there. Pie chart or a pie graph, I'm sure you've seen these around everywhere. This is the same data as we saw on the Pareto chart on the last page. And this one represents, you can see right away that slamming was the most, was the biggest category. Then we also have bad graphs. We also, we already talked about this just a little bit. Some graphs are bad because they have errors. Some are technically correct, but they're misleading. So this is an important thing to look out for. Here's an example. In this graph on the left, we had a question, do you agree with the court's decision to have the feeding tube removed? On the vertical axis, we have the percent who agreed, apparently from some survey. We have Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. So this one, it looks like the Democrats agreed much more frequently than the Republicans or the Independents if you just look at the graph. But if you look at the scale over here, this actually starts at 53. It doesn't start at zero, which makes it misleading. Because if we change this graph and had it start at zero, then this gives a much more accurate picture of the difference between the Democrats' response and the Republicans and Independents' response. Because as you can see, the frequency was only 54% here and 62% there, so it really didn't differ by that much. Another thing to look out for is graphs with different scales. This is, again, our ages of drivers killed in either car or motorcycle crashes. Notice on this one that our frequency, our vertical axis goes all the way up to 35. So we've got a lot higher frequencies in this one than in this one where our vertical scale only goes up to 12. Another thing you see a lot is pictographs. And these are graphs that use drawings or pictures to represent things. And these can be very misleading for a lot of reasons. This is one case if they use something that looks like a cube to represent things. The problem with a cube is that it's three-dimensional. A bigger side length or width makes it look like this is a whole lot bigger than this one. So it exaggerates the differences between the values. This would be a more fair representation of the data that was represented in the cubes on the last page. This gives you a more accurate picture.